cars. They come in all shapes and sizes, specs and models, and they help get us from point A to point B quickly and safely, but not always. In recent years, advances in technology have led to increased dependencies on things like cell phones. Not only that, but doing things like brushing your teeth, combing your hair, and eating food have all found their way behind the wheel. These habits are formally known as distracted driving. Distracted driving has led to accidents and even deaths of those being distracted and others on the road. As a young driver myself, I was very intrigued by the concept of distracted driving and decided to look into it myself. This documentary will serve as a foundation of defining what distracted driving is, how it is detrimental to everyone on the road, what is currently being done, and what can be done to end distracted driving or at least reduce it from its current level. Our journey first takes us to Upper Arlington High School, where Officer John Rice, a police officer and student resource officer of 20 plus years experience, defines what distracted driving is. You may have some prior knowledge of what distracted driving is, but there's a lot more to it than you may think. Uh, distracted driving is basically uh, operating a motor vehicle um, and not paying full attention to the roadway. Um, basically uh, reaching for a purse, reaching for coffee, food, uh, doing their makeup in cars, um, and just not, not paying attention to your surroundings. Like Officer Rice said, distracted driving can be a multitude of things, but it ultimately boils down to four categories, manual, visual, auditory, and cognitive. Manual can be considered manipulating anything other than the steering wheel, such as a mirror. Visual can be as simple as taking your eyes off the road and focusing on anything but the road. Auditory can be considered hearing anything that isn't related to the road and affects your ability to drive, such as a radio. Cognitive is basically when your mind is not on the road. You could be thinking about something else or even texting. According to Erie Insurance, activities that can be associated with these four criterions are as follows. Objects moving in the car. Adjusting parts of the car. Adjusting the radio or center console. Eating or drinking food. Reaching for a device such as a cell phone or GPS. Using a cell phone or even something as simple as talking with passengers in the car. Now that we know what distracted driving is, let's go over why it's detrimental to everyone on the road. I decided to ask Officer Rice what he notices when he's looking for people that are driving while distracted. It's, it's interesting that I have been behind people that have showed indicators that they were impaired. Uh, basically, you know, from alcohol, it's certain things we look for, not, not maintaining your lanes, uh, not using your signal, um, kind of left to center all over the place, hitting curbs, driving in the middle of the roadway. Um, so I, I, we've actually stopped people thinking that they were impaired, but they weren't. They were actually texting. This clip is a prime example of how distracted driving can be dangerous. This clip is not real, but it does reflect how driving while distracted can make you weave in and out of the opposite lane. The following clip is an actual accident that happened in Florida. The accident was caused by texting while driving. Pay attention to the weaving in and out of lanes. If you didn't think that last clip was bad, watch as this next SUV hits a semi because they weren't paying attention. As if those accident videos weren't enough to dissuade you from distracted driving, here's a shocking statistic. If you're driving at 55 miles per hour and you're looking at something other than the road, maybe your phone or a passenger, 4.6 seconds, that's like driving the length of a football field blindfolded. So if you're driving at that speed, or maybe even a slower or faster speed, 
you're still guaranteed to hit something because your attention is not on the road. Another reason why texting while driving and distracted driving are detrimental to everyone on the road is because they have a real cost. If you get into an accident or injure or kill someone, that person can't be replaced. A life has been lost and that text you sent or that distraction that took your eyes off the road could have waited. Take a look at some local examples of people who have died because of distracted driving. Adam S. Carter is a Central Ohio teen who lost his life in a car accident in 2008. After police studied the scene and performed an investigation, it was revealed that Adam was texting and driving. He was on his way to school when he hit a dump truck head-on while he was texting. Another Central Ohio distracted driving case is a story of Maria Tiberi. Maria Tiberi, whose father is a news anchor for 10TV News in Columbus, was driving at night when she hit a stopped tractor trailer and was killed. And I looked out the window and I saw seven policemen standing there and one of them said chaplain. And as a dad, you know, you just know this isn't good. That's a parent's worst nightmare. He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, she was in a horrible accident tonight and she didn't make it. There's been a tragedy impacting our 10DB family this morning, and we're sad to report that Dom Tiberi's 21-year-old daughter, Maria, died last night in a car accident along I-270. It turns out Maria was not texting and driving or driving under the influence, but instead she was distracted by something other than the road. The investigation couldn't pinpoint what exactly had distracted her. All we know is that her attention was not on the road and that something was distracting her. Not only do you face the possibility of injury or death, but you can also face criminal charges. Distracted drivers will be treated as criminals. A landmark verdict in Massachusetts today convicted a driver of vehicular homicide and his crime was blamed on texting while driving. The significance reaches far beyond this one case and here's ABC's Amy Roback. Negligent operation. Two families tearful when the verdict was read today. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Massachusetts Judge Stephen Albany then imposed the maximum sentence, two and a half years behind bars on 18-year-old Aaron DeVoe for texting and driving causing a head-on collision that killed 55-year-old Daniel Bowley. Today, speaking softly, DeVoe apologized. I made a mistake, and if I could take that back, I, I would take that. This after the victim's daughter tearfully addressed the court. I would wake up at night and hear my dad talking to me and get up and go look for him. He wasn't there. DeVoe will also lose his license for 15 years, a license he only had for five months prior to the fatal accident. Phone records show he received four text messages in the minutes before the crash. The last two at 2.34 and 2.35 p.m. According to prosecutors, the collision occurred at 2.36. You weren't the next time you think you can get away with distracted driving, just remember when you do this, you increase the likelihood of seeing this in your rear view mirror. So what's currently being done to mitigate distracted driving? The first thing is research. The Ohio State University has two driving simulators that are used by the university itself and companies. The research that can be conducted here can be about distracted driving and driving an automobile in general. With the permission of Dr. Kerwin, who is in charge of the simulator, I was able to see the simulator in person and even try it out. Honda came with uh, to OSU for the uh, idea of starting the simulator in, uh, in partnership with them. Uh, so it's an OSU simulator, but we have a, like I said before, a special relationship with, with Honda, uh, Honda R&D up in Marysville. This is the first and main OSU simulator. It uses the chassis and body of an 8th generation Honda Accord to make the driver feel as if they're in a real car. Dr. Kerwin says this specific model was chosen because it is a mid-sized car and that gives him and his fellow researchers the best idea of how the participants actually drive. The simulator has 260 degrees worth of projectors, which is the entire length of your field of vision from your left peripheral to right peripheral view. It also features LCD mirrors and cameras that are seen back at the command center. The cameras show the road, 
the driver, the dashboard, and other passengers that might be in the car. This is what the simulator looks like when it is being operated and run. Some of you may have noticed that the lack of an engine might make this simulator less realistic, but that's not true. To make up for an engine, Honda installed pumps and hydraulics that help give people the feel of an actual car, just like an internal combustion engine would. I can say from personal experience, no other virtual reality simulator, such as the Oculus Rift, feels quite like this one. Everything from the braking to the accelerating and even the turning all feel like a real car. The second simulator looks like this. It is not as immersive as the first one, but it is still quite elaborate. This simulator is one that can use real cars. All it has to be done is drive the car through the garage door and then hook it up to several devices in order to have all of the pertinent information needed for a study. Because you can drive an automobile in from the garage, this simulator is preferred for many companies. After everything is hooked up, the car can be monitored from this computer as well as another set that are brought in. I decided to ask Dr. Kerwin how simulators such as the ones they have help to mitigate distracted driving. For example, if uh, we have a scenario where a car stops suddenly in front of them while they're driving, we can determine if they're looking at uh, their phone, if they're looking at the, uh, the car in front of them, if they're looking at the dashboard, or they're looking at one of their mirrors. So we can determine uh, the situation that caused that accident. Other than simulators and research, there's laws in place already or being proposed nationwide. Officer Rice describes the law in the state of Ohio in this next clip. Um, there have been laws passed. Um, I believe in 2002 the governor signed a texting bill. Uh, basically if you're under 18 years old um, you're not allowed to be on the phone or texting. Um, and it is a primary offense if you're under 18. Currently, 38 states and the District of Columbia have penalties for drivers under the age of 18. The penalties can vary, but most make distracted driving in relation to cell phones a primary offense. 14 states have an all-out handheld devices in the car ban, and 46 states, plus the District of Columbia and some U.S. territories, have text messaging bans. Laws may be effective for some, but a Boston Magazine article found that one in four drivers won't change their behaviors because of the law. A lot of people see laws as more of a punishment than a deterrent. The final and best way that distracted driving can be mitigated is through advancements in technology. Some companies have already begun making devices for automobiles that ban cell phone signals in the car. Apps like DriveScribe block calls and text messages and send a message to the sender that says you are currently unavailable. It also tracks speed, and a good driving behavior can be rewarded with redeemable gift cards at select stores. Waze, another app, has the same idea as DriveScribe in the sense that it restricts users of the cell phone while driving at any speed, but Waze does allow you to still use the app while you are driving in certain instances. Bluetooth is also a handy feature for drivers who want to keep their attention on the road. Some Bluetooth options in cars allow the driver to have three apps at the ready. While Bluetooth is a better alternative than having people hold their phones, it is still technically a cognitive distraction. Tune to FM Radio. Tuning to FM Radio. Finally, we have devices such as Arigo. Arigo is a docking station that prevents the user from accessing or looking at their cell phone. The device won't let you start your car unless you put it in the lock. The device has a drawback of price as it is $150 to $280 for the device and installation. The company that makes Arigo is also trying to get funding but is running into trouble. With all of these solutions, emergency services and roadside assistance would still be possible to contact. 
So what do the experts have to say about finding solutions for distracted driving? The research that we do here can show uh, what types of behaviors and what types of devices uh, are very dangerous in the, the car and which are not so dangerous. So that can uh, help automakers and help uh, policymakers determine uh, what to have in the car. I think if we step up enforcement, if, if they made it a primary offense for over 18 years old, I think that would, I think that would actually benefit. Because just because you're 18, legally you're an adult, I, I still don't think that texting and driving I, I, I don't think it's a good idea, even for adults. So I think they should make that a primary offense, as they do for 18 and under. You know, and sometimes uh, you know, cell phone companies could you could come up with some kind of uh, some kind of software program to make it to where um, their phone's inoperable if it's if its GPS is moving more than five mile an hour or 10 miles an hour. Even out of all the technologies I just listed, there's still a possibility true technology to end distracted driving hasn't been developed yet. Companies, universities, and governments all around the world need to continue to do research in order to find the perfect solution to mitigate distracted driving. Until then, here's what you need to do as an individual. Buckle up, turn your phone off and put it away, and make sure everyone else in the car as well turns theirs off and puts it away. Keep your eyes on the road while you're driving.